Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, it's a rather unusual one today. I've had a couple of people, not just one, but actually two people ask me a very similar thing. Uh, how can you, what's the simplest method or what's a real easy method to electronically trigger some sort of spring-loaded mechanism and they both gave an example of something like a mousetrap even though that's what they weren't trying to do they were trying to do something else but you know a basic spring-loaded mechanism like that that's the easiest way to electronically trigger it and of course one of the first things you'd think of for triggering something like that is some sort of solenoid base system you know you apply a voltage to a coil and it pulls a plate back or something like that I don't know bit too complicated thought got to be able to do it with Ohm's law surely and sure enough I reckon you can simple a resistor is all you need a resistor and a voltage source here's your this is how I would do it I would uh, this is your thing that you want to hold back with your spring mechanism you just have some cord fishing line nylon string cotton polyester whatever I don't know, wrap it around the resistor tie it off so it holds it back and then when you want to trigger the thing pass some current through the resistor heats it up and uh, it weakens the string or whatever it is and until it breaks and then bing gone simple I'm gonna try it looks like fun and here we go I've got my mouse trap or it's actually a much larger rat trap it's the eradicator I love it awesome sounding name um, I've tied back the uh, arm in plate here because we're not going to hold down the arm here with the traditional arming plate we're going to hold it back with this uh i've actually tied some fishing line on there and i'll show you that in a sec um and i've just uh, tied it back so this is actually armed at the moment it's just tied back so it doesn't accidentally go off in my hands which would be uh, rather nasty now i've got this fishing line it's tied off down here it's probably hard to hard to see it but this fishing line i've, I've wrapped one turn around the arm here and I've tied it off around the bottom uh, on, on sorry on the other side but on the bottom here I've got a 10 ohm resistor and I've wrapped a uh, one turn of the uh, fishing line around the 10 ohm resistor so when that heats up it should eventually get to a point where it uh, weakens where the fishing line weakens enough and it will break and bingo it'll lift the arm up and boom it'll uh, activate the trap so let's give it a go uh 10 ohm resistor isn't too bad it means it should uh, trigger on the order of uh volts we don't have to put much power through this at all it's a standard quarter watt resistor so we should only have to put like a watt or uh something or maybe even two at uh, most take the tape off here and arm this sucker fishing line should have more than enough strength to hold back that trap there because there's because we have a big uh, lever arm here so there's uh, quite a large uh, leverage there and uh, that should hold there nicely and bingo it's ready to go and let me get my blast shield just in case I don't want to damage my new camera here I don't want the thing flicking towards the camera and I'll set up the high-speed camera on the side and we'll see if we can capture this and uh, I'm 100% sure this will work. I'm going to switch my load voltage on. I've got it to zero and uh, I will wind up the wick. And let's see if we can uh, make this sucker do anything. Here we go. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> awesome! And that sucker's smoking too. I love it. And there's the melted fishing line around our resistor. I turned that up uh, fairly quickly because of my um, high-speed camera. I've got to um, trigger this thing within 10 seconds. That's all it captures. So, um, But you could actually uh, do that at a lower current. Uh, it would just uh, take more time to actually um, generate the heat 
in the resistor and uh, and melt the in in this case fishing line but you can go and try um, uh, other things you know nylon polyester all sorts of uh, all sorts of stuff if you want I think they may have uh, higher melting points than something like fishing line I'm not sure but great fun go and experiment with it and really I don't think you can uh, get a simpler trigger mechanism than Ohm's law And that, of course, brings us to the humble quarter watt resistor. Let's take a look at it and see what happens when you pass uh, close to the maximum rated power through one of these resistors. Now, we've got a data sheet here of a uh, typical axial quarter watt resistor. And the figure we're interested in down here is what's called the thermal, uh, the thermal resistance, R. TH here and as you can see it's 140 K per watt or Kelvins per watt or basically degrees Celsius per watt so if you put one watt into the or if this if this if this resistor dissipates one watt then its temperature is going to rise by 140 degrees Kelvin or 140 degrees Celsius above the current ambient temperature and the power rating of a resistor is something that beginners forget a lot about. Now here's two graphs which uh, show us um, basically the rise in temperature here, uh, rise in temperature, degrees Kelvin, versus the power dissipated in watts. And it exactly matches that thermal resistance we saw, that figure we saw before. Look, if you put one quarter watt, if, if you dissipate a quarter watt in that resistor, it will rise by 35 degrees Kelvin or 35 degrees Celsius uh, for a quarter watt. And that means, and if you multiply that by four for one watt, as this thing wouldn't handle a watt, but if it did, then uh, uh, you would get that 140 degrees Celsius per watt. Now, a lot of people, a lot of beginners think, oh, this quarter watt, this quarter watt resistor can handle a quarter watts. Yeah, it can. It's designed to do that continuously but it will rise by 35 degrees C above your ambient temperature and that's the key thing it doesn't get to 35 degrees it gets to 35 degrees plus your current so if your labs at 20 degrees Celsius that's already 50 that component that resistor is going to get to 55 degrees Celsius and if your labs it you know if you're using the product outside in summertime it's 30 degrees Celsius then you're going to be that resistor is going to be at 65 degrees Celsius and so on and you can get higher temperature resistors which can actually uh, you can get uh, the not all quarter watt resistors are the same size they can actually be physically different uh, sizes and yeah they all handle a quarter watts but they might the smaller ones might get well will get physically hotter with that quarter watt they won't be the same as this particular one so uh, just something to watch out for when you're designing your boards don't if you are going to go to the limit and dissipate a quarter watt in a quarter watt resistor just make sure that your board can handle uh, that your product can handle that temperature make sure there's adequate airflow and things like that if you put this resistor if you mount it on the board right next to an electrolytic capacitor then well that the temperature of the nearby electrolytic capacitor is going to rise which may derate its life and things like that i've explained that before on uh, various episodes of the blog now if you're curious about this graph on the right hand side here it's very similar to the one on the left now the one on the left we just looked at is what's called the hot spot temperature and that's basically the temperature in the core of the resistor itself or you can take it essentially um, as the temperature of the case of the actual resistor itself but this one over here um, is uh, a temperature it's exactly the same y-axis temperature rise versus x-axis power dissipated but it's the temperature rise at the end of the lead when it's soldered into a board like this when you've actually put it on there you bend the leads 
and you've got an X amount of lead length and you trim them off and they're soldered onto the individual pads. Okay, now this is, let's say you leave five millimeters lead length at each end of the resistor. This here, Y axis, will be the temperature on the actual pad itself. Uh, and that's the key because you can actually use your PCB as as a heatsink itself, if you actually put it close enough to the leads, then the PCB can help dissipate the heat from the core of the resistor itself. But there are limits actually to that because the leads themselves have a certain thermal resistance and it becomes a thermal resistance series equation and stuff like that. I've done a previous uh, blog on that for um, heat sinks and things like that. But yeah, you can use your PCB as a heat sink to help dissipate the heat in your product. So that's something to think of. If you are designing um, a product which will uh, tr which will dissipate close to the maximum power in that resistor itself. And as you can see, this is no longer a linear graph like this. It, it actually tapers off like that depending on the lead length which you actually have. Now, the, uh, the greater the lead, the smaller the lead length, the more linear the line becomes and because of the thermal resistance in that actual lead itself. So if you have uh, uh, a longer lead length of 15 millimeters, as you can see, the temperature will drop off. And, and if you bent it right out here and had like 25 millimeters or 30 millimeters of lead length and bent it right there, you know, really extreme kind of stuff, it'd taper off something like that. And you would actually get very little heat at the end because all the heat would be in the core plus a little bit dissipated um, along the leads itself. So if you're going to do that, uh, try and trim them closer to the board so that you can actually get, you don't lose as much heat in the legs and you can uh, take the uh, heat out of the core of the resistor itself. And this brings us on to a, what's called a derating curve. Every resistor data sheet will have one of these. Not all, only few of them will actually have the actual um, thermal resistance graph like this, but they'll have what's called a derating curve. And basically it shows its uh, maximum power dissipated or 100% of its nominal rated value. Now, basic resistors like this are almost always spec'd at a wattage, in this case a quarter watt resistor is specified at a temperature, maximum temperature of 70 degrees C. And that's why it's shown on the graph here with this dotted line going up at 70 degrees uh, Celsius on the X axis here. And that's uh, actually ambient. That's ambient temperature, not the temperature rise as in the resistor as we've actually looked at. So if, you, if you're designing your product to work over a temperature range, say up to 70 degrees Celsius, then the resistor can actually dissipate um, two and a half, it's nominal two and a half watts and continue to function, function correctly. And that's fine because the temperature rise plus the ambient temperature um, will still be within the working limits of the resistor itself. But after 70 degrees C, it derates linear like this until it gets to a point in this case for this particular resistor even though it isn't this one but this data sheet for this resistor is 155 degrees so that will be the maximum absolute maximum temperature that you can use the resistor at because and then you won't be able to dissipate any power in it because you can't go beyond that temperature it just won't uh, work anymore or it won't be reliable or something like that what does all this have to do with our mouse track well not much at all, uh, really, but uh, I just wanted to show some things on resistors.